Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that your presence is here with us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can come into this place. And as Pastor Mike said, we don't come out of routine or religion, but we come, we come because we want to encounter the living God. We want to encounter you this morning. We are here this morning not because of us, but because of you. And so this morning we pray that, that our words and our actions glorify your name that it is not my words that are spoken this morning, but they are yours, and that our hearts are prepared to hear what you have for us this morning. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whoa, whoa, don't sit down yet. <laughs> nearly, nearly. We're going to read a scripture in a second, so we may as well stay standing. But I want you to think about this statement for one second. God desires to be the nucleus of our lives. God doesn't want part of us or what we can afford to give, but he wants us wholeheartedly. He wants us to be completely his. We're going to read a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. And some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not, but we're going to read it. It's going to be on the screen, um, and you don't have to all read it at the same time. I'm going to read it, but this is, we're going to stand for the reading of God's word. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall repeat them diligently to your sons, and speak to them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. And you shall also tie them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. This is called the Shema. It is a traditional blessing that is read out day and night by the religious Jewish community. It is something that was written in the book of Deuteronomy and the instruction was given to Moses by God for the people of Israel. At this stage in Deuteronomy, the, the Israelites had been wandering and they had heard the commands or the Ten Commandments that he had given Moses in Exodus, but they are now being prepared to move into the Promised Land. And so what's happening is Moses has gathered the new generation of Israelites that are about to enter into the promised land. And, and what he's saying is we've got the Ten Commandments, but now we're going to expand on those. And here are some additional commandments that you're going to hear. This is something that we're going to pray and believe. And so the Shema was, to, was said as a ritual or as a prayer morning and night. As we know though, the the Old Testament isn't just for the, the Jewish people or the or the Hebrews, it's for all. And in Matthew chapter twenty two verses thirty six to forty, Jesus repeats the Shema to the Pharisees. The thing I love about it though is that he just doesn't keep that particular commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. He adds another one. He adds to love your neighbor as yourself. The word Shema literally means to listen and obey, to hear, then to do. The passage commands the people of Israel to love the Lord with their, all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their strength. And essentially, it is a call for us to love God with our entire being. With everything that we are, we are to love God. Now, this word is going to be particularly challenging because um, there is going to be a sense of vulnerability. Because I, like yourselves, have not arrived 
at understanding God completely and completely submitting myself to him. It exposes weaknesses in my own life. And how good is it to do it from a public platform? (laughs) However, I do believe it will encourage us and God is always on the move to challenge us. This is this passage is a constant reminder that we are on a journey. We are on a pursuit of loving God continually. And we are to submit ourselves to him in every single part of our life. But there is a cost. And the question I ask my, myself and you today is, at what cost? I've come to realize that throughout the course of Scripture that God just doesn't want parts of us, but he wants all of us. He wants our entire being. The very words used in the Shema, when literally translated, means Israel, actively listen and obey the commands that I'm about to give you. This is how you will show your love for me with your entire mind, thoughts, emotions, feelings and will your entire being, and all of your resources. In essence, God is commanding that we are to give him every last fibre of our being, every section and every area of our lives, every word that proceeds from our mouth, every resource that you have, submit it to him. And this shows your commitment, your dedication, and your love For Yahweh. These are powerful words and words that we shouldn't take lightly. So, again, I ask you the question at what cost? On the 26th of January 2007, two people stood before God, their family, and a minister and declared their love for one another. Clarissa and I were to be wed on the 26th of January 2007 and and so therefore it was a day where we stood before God, our family and a minister and committed ourselves to one another. We said vows to one another and on that day I was so excited, I was nervous, I was full of anticipation and when it came to saying the actual vows, to be perfectly honest, the whole thing is a blur. I can't can't remember it. I'm pretty sure the minister could have said anything and I still would have said I do. <laughs> but I'm, I'm pretty sure the vows went something along these lines. It said, I, Christopher Ross Valentine, that's my middle name for those who are wondering, take you, Clarissa, I won't say her middle name because she might get funny about it, <laughs> um, <laughs> and promise to cherish you always, to honour and sustain you in sickness and in health, in poverty and in wealth, And to be true to you in all things until death alone shall part us. And then there was the rings bit where we gave over the rings and it says, with this ring, I, insert name here, take you, insert name there, uh, to be one with yourself, loving what I know of you and trusting what I do not yet know. I will respect your integrity and have faith in your abiding love for me through all our years and in all that our life may bring us. Now, I know Clarissa loved me because when she said these vows, particularly around the old, the whole poverty and riches thing, I knew that she loved me because she did not marry me for my money. She married me for my good looks, and that's about it at this point. (laughs) Oh, I kid. Now, I was only a humble apprentice at that stage, so I know that Clarissa loved me for who I was. I think it's important that if you're married, that you constantly remind each other of the vows that you made. In the Shema, the the religious Hebrews will have leather bound around their wrists as a constant reminder when they look down. That's a reminder of who they're dedicated to. They wear bands across their foreheads with little cubes that have the Shema written inside It's a reminder. And it probably could do us good if we were to remind each other of our vows that we made to one another all those years ago. I know how much Clarissa loved me. However, sometimes when you say words and you're nervous and and those sorts of things, we don't realise how much power our words carry. 
How often we use our words flippantly without really understanding what we are saying. Now, I love Clarissa and Clarissa, and she knows how much I love her now, and she knew how much I loved her then. But on reflection, if I was to look honestly, I was so caught up in the emotion, in the nerves and the excitement of the day, that the minister could have said anything, and I still would have said I do. But let me be clear, this is not a statement of regret. This is an example of how at times we use words without fully understanding what we're saying. We sign contracts, we make promises. We do things at times so flippantly because our culture has taken away the integrity of the spoken word. Now, I'm going to be the first person to put my hand up that I on occasion will commit the odd faux pas or social blunder, that I might say words a little bit loosely and a bit flippantly and if I had taken two seconds to think about the words before they came out of my mouth, I would have saved the inevitable backlash that would have happened. I'm sure many of you have experienced that from this very pulpit. And sometimes I've even made promises where I thought I could do something and, and live up to something, but when I saw the enormity of the situation, I haven't been able to do so. Even the things that come from our lips have a cost. So coming back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, when God gives the, the command to love him with every single part of us, and we say, yeah, no worries, I can do that. But do we live it out? Are we actually prepared to follow him and be his disciples? And as followers of Christ, are we prepared to do what a disciple is called to, called to do? And I ask again, at what cost? The cost of being a disciple is, is pretty real. Jesus spoke about the cost of being a disciple in, a couple, in many passages of Scripture throughout the New Testament. And a couple I've got here is Luke 14, 33. This is Jesus saying, In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. This is not me saying it, this is Jesus. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. These are stark realities. These are powerful words. But when Jesus called us to himself and he found us, we responded and said, yes, I will. But were we really prepared for what it would cost us? Are we really prepared to call ourselves disciples or followers of Jesus without the full understanding of what it means to follow him? What it means to take up your cross daily and follow him? Now, does this mean that we, we sit down and heaped ash and, and sackcloth and we look at the world around us with, with despair and, and this false humility? No, that's, that's far from what God wants us to do. We've been created in the image of God. He wants us to live life full of joy, full of happiness, full of purpose. But to be a disciple of Christ means firstly by taking up your cross and laying it at his feet. Letting the Lord lead you through and, obe and through obedience we say yes. To take up our cross daily means to die to our own plans, our own dreams and our own desires and put to death our selfish arrangements so that Christ can be the very, very centre of our focus, that our entire self is towards him. Our fellowship of God is not focused on our plans and our desires and the things that we want to get out of life, but we lay those things down and that is the cost. I love the way in Psalm 119, David, throughout that entire chapter, says on a number of occasions, I love your commands. I love your discipline. And I look at David and said, I wonder why he says that. And then he goes, I love those things because they are the things that keep me on the path. See, when I try and do things in my own strength, see, David goes, when I do things in my own strength, it doesn't end good. I have adultery. 
I take up a census. I'm not the father that I'm supposed to be, but I love your commands and I love your discipline because I've realized I cannot do this on my own. I need you because every purpose you have is good. Every purpose that he has is good. The cost of following Christ is not an abstract one, but it's one of action. The Shema calls us to action. It is the activation of our faith and our redemption that we should be moved, not just being hearers of the word, but doers. James chapter 1. The book of James is fast coming my favorite, one of my favorite books of the Bible. And it's, it's pretty much the Proverbs of the New Testament. And you guys know how much I love the book of Proverbs. But it's a great way in which, again, it, it pairs our salvation and activation. James chapter 1, 19 verse 20, verses, 1 verses 19 to 26 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth, well, I love that, and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. The word that is planted in you. Do what it says. Oh, sorry. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks in, at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, that's Christ, that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God, our Father, accepts is pure and faultless. Uh, is this, to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. God doesn't want us to take bits and pieces of the world and then apply it to our life. He doesn't want us to be half in and half out. Even James talks about having a divided mind. He wants us all in. He wants us to be all in submitting to the will of of the Father. Now, I may offend some today and I apologise, but um, I hazard a guess that after you've left the building today, that the words have gone in and then straight out again. Now, I only hazard that guess because, and I know that will be people like that because that's me. I know that doesn't bring a lot of comfort to Pastor Mike, myself, Ethan, and those who, have, who, who speak, but on occasion, it goes in and then out. I've heard the word. I've heard good word. But it hasn't taken root in my heart. What we need to do is meditate on the word. We need to hear it and then we have to mull it over. We have to start to digest it. Now, I'm going to use an illustration of a cow. A cow will take grass from the field and he will grind that bit of grass down and down and down. And then it goes down, then it comes back up and he grinds away again. And what the analogy there is that he's making it digestible. We have to make the word of God digestible by playing it over in our mind, not just to hear it and then go out the other side, but to hear it, let it meditate in our heart, let it take root. It's not just about hearing, it's now about doing. James is pointing out that we have been given faith through grace, but from there, that point on, there is a new work that starts. Here James is highlighting the fact that the Shema was not just for the Old Testament, but for the New. Essentially, it's saying, you've heard, now go and do. Salvation leads to service. And it is a self-deception to believe that God's goal for the churchgoer is just attendance, 
to merely hear the word. God's goal is that we experience transformation of a life that results in ministry or whatever plans God has called you to do. That is your ministry. If we just merely hear the word, we'll quickly forget it. Just like looking at yourself in the mirror and realizing you don't have a nose. It's only those who act upon and hear the word of God and its commandments. It then continues to be a blessing. However, all of this comes at a cost. This is not just something that we just liberally give over. It all comes at a cost. We've now been fully transformed in Christ. We have now been made in his image. We are fully submitting ourselves to him and allowing for our lives to be completely transformed. It's easy to hear. It's easy to say the right words. But from where do those words come from? Are those words from a repentant and regenerated heart? James speaks clearly to controlling the tongue. Our tongue is our actions, our words. He actually spends nearly an entire chapter in chapter 3 specifically around the use of our words and how our words carry incredible weight and to use them without thought or to make a statement of belief without heartfelt genuineness is dangerous. To proclaim that we love Yahweh with all of our heart requires us to think carefully about the words that we say, the promises that we make, and not to be flippant or loose-lipped in our commitment to him. Now, thank goodness we serve a God who fulfills his promises, that when he makes a statement, not like a tradie who say, I'll be there at 7 and gets there at 4.30. I was, I was a tradie, so I can say that. But God says something and then does it. That's what we have faith in. That's what we have trust in. Not, not necessarily in what is spoken. And, and again, we use loose lips and we say we'll do things and we'll, we'll say we'll be there or I'm committed to this and I'm committed to that. But again, it's, we've still got this little bit of a tension between only if it serves my purposes, my will. Thank goodness we serve a God who is not like that. He wants us to be committed wholeheartedly his. There's a worship song that you may be fairly familiar with and, and the first line of the verse goes like this, I'm caught up in your presence and I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment and I never want to leave. And then the pre-chorus says this, and this is really interesting. I'm sorry when I've gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I've just sang another song. It says, take me back to where I started. I open up my heart to you. It says, I'm sorry when I've come with my own intentions. I'm sorry if I've made it not enough. Who else has ever walked in and just done it out of religious habitual motion? How we've walked into church or to serve God with the same old attitude. And this is precisely what James is talking about. That we could be hearing, that we can be singing, worshipping, but it's just lip service. Our minds may be elsewhere. But our commitment to God must go beyond what we just say. It's like that adage, we must walk the walk and we must talk the talk. Now, I just want to pause here to, to say that this is, I'm not talking about salvation. Salvation comes through grace, comes through faith. The gift of grace is our salvation. It isn't the good works of man that get us to eternity. But it is only faith. But the emphasis I believe that scripture does make for us is that now that we have salvation, we need to cultivate it. We need to mature it. And most of all, we need to come to know our Saviour more and more each day. 
The vision for this year is to know him, to know him more, not from a head knowledge, not intellectually, but to know him spiritually, relationally as a fellowship, to know him deeper than we've known him ever before. On a personal level, I have discovered the love of our father, the love of Christ. Once again, it's funny, you hear, the, you hear I've, I grew up a Christian my entire life, I've been in church my entire life, and you hear the same words over and over and over again. But it's not until you really fully understand what it looks like, what it cost Christ, do we fully understand. Love comes at a cost. To love one another comes at a cost. God sent his own son for us. It is a sacrificial love that goes beyond really our understanding. But I believe Romans chapter 12 gives us an insight in how we can actively love. This is where we start to obey exactly. The Shema says, hear, listen, and obey. This is the part where we've heard. Romans chapter 12 tells us how we can. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves or setting yourselves apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world with its superficial values or customs, but be transformed and progressively changed by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourself what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purposes for you. There are those words that we love, a living sacrifice. Not a dead one, a living one. But why do we need to give it all to God? Why do we have to submit everything to him? Why isn't it enough for me just to take my salvation? I've got eternity. Why can't I just come to church? Why can't I just be a pew sitter? Why do I have to bear fruit? Well, the best way that I've found to look at it is Jesus came and he just didn't give part of, part of himself for you. He didn't just take, say, take the pinky. Just take the arm. They're all jerks. No, he gave himself entirely. He didn't give part. He gave it all. He just didn't give what he could afford. He gave everything. He gave it to those who would blaspheme him, who would spit on him, who would reject him, not only in that moment, but for years to come. He still did it. And this is the part that breaks me every time. I'm broken. I am a jerk. I sin. I repent. And then I sin again. But he gave everything for us. Pastor Mike hit it perfectly this morning. That when we take communion, it is not just something. It is everything. Without it, we don't have this. We don't have that. It is everything. He left eternity for us. He humbled himself and became a servant, according to Philippians 2. But by his grace, we have been made righteous. My salvation is secure because of his sacrificial love. And if that is what Christ has given me and you, and I am set free and my eternity is secure, the lens I now look through is an eternal one. He is love and we are to show it. He paid the price, the ultimate cost. And all he requires of us is our whole selves in action. That's what it costs us. 
But how do we show this amazing love that Christ gave us? Well, I believe Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 19 says it perfectly. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. Love is to be sincere and active, the real thing, without guile or hypocrisy. Hate what is evil and detest all ungodliness. Do not tolerate wickedness. Hold on tightly to what is good. Be devoted to one another with authentic brotherly affection as members of one family. That's us. Give preference to one, to one another in honour, never lagging behind in diligence, a glow in the spirit, enthusiastically serving the Lord, constantly rejoicing in hope because of our confidence in Christ. Amen. Steadfast and patient in distress, devoted to prayer, continually seeking wisdom, guidance and strength. Contributing to the needs of God's people, pursuing the practice of hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, who cause you harm or hardship. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and share in the joy with others. And weep with those who weep, sharing in others' grief. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, conceited, self-important, exclusive. But associate with humble people, those with a realistic self-view. I love that. And this is the best part. Do not overestimate yourself. Never repay anyone evil for evil. Take thought of what is right and gracious and proper in the sight of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That is what it is to love. God's love for us so overwhelms us that sometimes we forget that there is some action required. But God is imploring us through every portion of Scripture. Don't just hear it, do it. Don't just say you love me, actively love me. Pursue me, chase after me, because I first chased you. I pursued you. We have an opportunity. We have the best gift ever given to us. The best gift that we've ever been given is Christ. We don't. Well, sometimes we take that for granted. I know I do. I forget that it says in Scripture to be a light. Don't go putting it under a basket. Be a light. You've got the gift of salvation. Now go and show it. I encourage everyone today that it comes at a cost. The life and the the life of a believer and the life of a disciple isn't easy. We have got it so good here in the West. And sometimes it's the distraction and it's the pull from here and there that keeps us from really stepping into what God's called us to do. But once we're there, once we understand our brokenness, once we understand that our ways are no good, His ways are best. That without His, dis His discipline and without His commands, we are just wandering. But what He wants is us to be all in. All in. I'm not just talking about service in church. I'm talking about our devotion, our worship, our quiet time the things that draw us closer to God, that the way that we speak to our children, I believe that, that time is of the essence, that the Shema talks about, speak to your children. When you get up in the morning, declare your love for Him. When you go to bed, declare your love for Him. When you speak to your children, declare your love for Him. Help them to understand what it means to love Jesus. As parents, we have a responsibility not to let them wander, but we are to guide and instruct our children. Our, the world is telling them, just let them be who they want to be. But no, as a parent, we have a responsibility, a God-given responsibility to say, do this. It's good for you. We're sheep. We wander. We need a really good shepherd. 
in everything that you do. Submit it to Him first. With every decision that you do, think about the eternal perspective rather than the immediate one. It changes the lens. It changes your viewpoint. It changes how you make a decision. It comes at a cost. But do you know what? It's absolutely worth every bit of it. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that, that there's going to be hard and tough times. But He's come so that we can overcome those things. There is breakthrough and hope. And our hope is in Him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, the fact that we are in relationship with you, that we, you have found us, you have sought us out, and that we have said yes is so good. But I pray this morning, Lord Jesus, that there is going to be action to our faith, that we don't hear, but we do. That we don't just say the right words, but we live them out. That we just don't declare how good you are, we live it out. We don't say how much we love you, we live it out. So the, this morning, I pray for each and every one of us. Lord Jesus, help us. In our own flesh, in our own weakness, Lord Jesus, we think that we've got it all together, but really we don't. We need you. We need you more than any other. And so, Father, this morning, we thank you that we are on this journey of submitting all to you giving you our whole selves to be completely yours. So this morning, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.